Hello and thank you for uh, attending my talk. Uh, I'm James Ruffer. Uh, a little bit about me. I own a, uh, a dev shop called Web3 Devs. It's a decentralized blockchain development team. Um, we're actually decentralized. We're all over the place. Uh, I'm based in uh, Gainesville. Um, a lot of the guys uh, started out in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, Seattle, uh, and then we slowly expanded to Barbados, uh, Japan, uh, Poland, and Turkey by way of Ukraine, ironically. Uh, we've been in the industry since 2015, um, but we've been together as a team uh, since about 2007. Uh, we started in the fintech space and then uh, just fell in love with all things uh, uh, blockchain and, and DeFi. Uh, my, my first language is uh, not English, if you read that. Um, so this is a, one of my biggest pet peeves, and this is the whole reason I did this, uh, is just to go over this one paragraph, and then I'll stop my presentation and run away. <laughs> but this is the definition that Google gives for blockchain, and I'm gonna do something a pres presenter should never do. I'm gonna read from the slide. A uh, system of which record of transactions made in Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency are maintained across several network computers that are linked to a peer-to-peer -peer network. This is the worst definition ever. And I really wish Google would update this. And um, it's just a pet peeve of mine. And, and uh, it, it's, it's so outdated that uh, in every presentation, I beg people not, not to use that. Or if they do use it, at least let people know that Bitcoin is not blockchain. So if you get anything from this presentation, Bitcoin is not blockchain. Thanks for having me. Matt here. Um, Bitcoin is actually um, uses blockchain. So blockchain is the underlying technology for Bitcoin. The reason that everybody thinks or a lot of the definitions are all about Bitcoin is because that first use case of using blockchain has always been Bitcoin and it's been the biggest success to date uh, for use of blockchain. Um, but um, please, if you take anything out of that, then Bitcoin is not blockchain. But we will talk a lot about Bitcoin uh, through this uh, because, again, it's an amazing use case and it's uh, done some amazing things for the, for the technology of blockchain itself. Um, so we basically a description of, of what blockchain is, right? So um, Bitcoin on top of blockchain basically came from um, a gentleman who wrote a white paper who was very frustrated with centralized systems, centralized banking systems, centralized exchanges. Um, a lot of people, you might have heard that, you know, uh, the, the, the rule on Wall Street of how angry they got when it, when it crashed uh, the bubble and took out many families and mortgages and, and things like that. So he wrote this interesting white paper and basically wanted to go uh, in a different concept with a lot of transparency and built blockchain in order to do that, and then again used Bitcoin to basically prove, prove the concept. So here we basically see three types of, of networks. The first one we're kind of used to, um, we probably use on a, a, a daily basis, which is a centralized network, right? One node that rules them all. Uh, our banking system, like the bank that you use, is typically done this way. Um, if you walk into your bank and ask them to see their general ledger, They'll probably laugh at you, and then you'll see security slowly start walking towards you. Um, the, a lot of misconceptions between um, blockchain is the difference between decentralized and distributed, right? So decentralized essentially is um, uh, multiple nodes that talk together, but still has the ability to have sub-nodes underneath it. So that, not, that is not exactly blockchain. Uh, distributed completely, which is nodes that are independently that talk to each other, that don't rule each other, is more what blockchain is actually based on. So I get this question um, all the time, is uh, why should we use blockchain? And, um, and we actually ask clients that engage us why they want to use blockchain. Um, so we basically have to find out uh, if blockchain is actually a use, good use case um, for, for them or if a database 
will actually just work uh, in exchange for it. Because using blockchain, there's um, certain speed issues, there's certain um, security issues. Uh, the, the number one thing that we actually uh, promote or talk about first is, do you need historical tamper-proof data? And that's the number one use case that we've started seeing uh, Fortune companies, uh, proof of concepts come through is because that's actually how they're introducing um, blockchain into um, their web app, is that tamper-proof historical data. Um, so what do we mean by that? So if we essentially, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use uh, Bitcoin as an example, we'll, we'll talk about how we actually use, could use blockchain in, in the real world, right? So if you have a physical dollar, regardless if it's a one, five, 10, 50, 100, uh, if you're lucky enough to still have the 500, you'll actually see a little serial number that's associated with that, right? So if I give someone a dollar, we can actually record where that dollar goes in real time, right? So there's, there's uniqueness in all of our physical money. And that's kind of the same thing with Bitcoin. Right? So if I take uh, any amount of Bitcoin and give it to someone else, we could essentially record that on, on the network. We could do that in the, in the physical sense as well, and then also know that a dollar is just a dollar. Right? So this dollar is not worth more or less than this dollar. They're kind of the same value. And that's the same with a Bitcoin token. So my token or your token or someone else's token, no matter how many times we switch it or trade it, that value is always going to stay the same based on that particular time. And we have the ability to actually track that. And the reason we have the ability to track that again is that network that we talked about, which is the distributed. So every time something happens on the network, somebody writes it down, right? So I have that dollar, I have that serial number, I gave it to Bob, Bob gave it back to me, et cetera. And then what that ledger does is talks with all the other ledgers and we basically log it. And if anybody disputes whether or not I gave Bob a dollar or five dollars, they can look at all the other ledgers and have proof or know how that transaction actually happened. So if any bad actors come in and say, no, 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 I, I definitely gave Bob five dollars and not one dollar, we have that tamper-proof historical data to prove how that particular transaction happened. And again, the, the best use case that we've been able to use has been Bitcoin. Um, but if you think about it, having that basically ledger that's tamper-proof, you don't just have the ability to use currency or Bitcoin, you can do many other things. So if you think about in your company of a transaction that happens, regardless if it's uh, money, or currency, or maybe it's just um, something that you need health care or something that you need to prove has happened, insurance, things like that, having that tamper-proof historical data that not only you but other people can actually look into, that in, my, in our opinion is the best use case to actually use blockchain um, the way that it is today. So we talked about a dollar is a dollar, Bitcoin is a Bitcoin. I'm gonna reiterate that because we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. Um, the other interesting thing that's happened in time with blockchain is the ability to actually program these tokens, right? And so now we basically have programmable currency and that's very powerful. That's been very powerful for the last few years for us and a, a good use case or a fun use case um, is betting, right? So if, uh, so, Last night, tonight, and tomorrow, um, Yankees are playing the Mets. Go Yankees. And if uh, Bob and I basically wanted to bet on the outcome of that particular uh, game, uh, in a traditional sense, we both would probably have to find a third party to escrow our money, and then at the end, figure out who won without fighting, or have, maybe I have to go find Bob when the Yankees win to go get my money. Um, the, one of the powerful things about blockchain is these smart contracts that you can write um, that can be delivered automatically is I basically load a smart contract with my dollar, Bob loads his smart contract with his dollar, 
and that's kind of the escrow. So we don't need that third party. We have basically programmable money that's trusted. And then we have something that basically triggers it or proves it or there's a success fail that basically releases that contract to either give James, Bob, or in a tie, maybe a refund uh, to, to both people. So um, one way of doing that instead of a third party is something called an oracle. Uh, what an oracle is in this case could be ESPN, uh, Yahoo, anybody that basically is a trusted network that Bob and I both would consider uh, a trusted that when the game is done and has a final score that would trigger that particular contract. Um, Chainlink is basically a Oracle network that takes it a step further. Um, so we could probably tie into an ESPN API or a Yahoo API to pull that to trigger it, or we can actually put that on blockchain as a trusted resource to where others can basically see, okay, James received that money and the proof or the, um, the way that there is no um, back door or shadiness going on here is they can actually see the resource on the blockchain of where they got the results to be able to trigger that Oracle uh, and, and that smart contract. So that's just one fun use case that a lot of people started using with, with uh, blockchain is, is betting. But if you think about that, the power of programmable money inside of a smart contract that has that transparency in your own, in your own uh, um, um, environment, you can do many, many uh, more things, which we'll talk about as we go on. Um, so these are some of the networks that have popped up um, since we started. Again, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum were, were the top two. Uh, Bitcoin, um, again, is, is, in my opinion, has been proven. It's tamper-proof. Um, it's distributed. It's also decentralized, um, and it's throughout the world. So it's, it's not controlled by one person. It can never, in my opinion, be controlled by one person. It's always going to be uh, a trusted network. However, it's extremely slow, right? Um, and it's also uh, can't handle a lot of transactions per second. So because of these um, issues, uh, Ethereum and all these other networks basically started popping up to resolve uh, a lot of these, a lot of the issues. And Ethereum is probably um, the second largest and the most used when it comes to uh, programmers is because they're the ones that actually first introduced smart contracts to be able to tie things to tokens and be able to release um, and do really interesting things um, transparently on the blockchain. Um, Stellar, Ripple um, were primarily used to move money around internationally, um, which is interesting. So if you wanted to move you know, money from the United States to China, um, to use traditional rails, you'd have to use something like a Western Union that would transfer to a China pay. And then by the time the money actually got there, you're probably paying close to 100 US dollars um, to be able to move that money in a traditional rails. Um, using Stellar or Ripple, um, you're talking about hay pennies uh, to be able to move any amount of money um, between one person to another, um, as long as there's an exchange um, on the other end. But the rails to move it um, have really disrupted the finance of SWIFT and wires and things like that. Um, the rest of these are um, probably, I basically just Google the top, um, the top 20, top 10. Um, a couple of these are stable coins, which we'll go over later. And then a lot of them are, are kind of uh, uh, up and coming, which are really neat that we'll talk about uh, in a bit. And yes, I know I forgot about Deutsche Coin, and that was on purpose. Although Mark Cuban made a really good uh, comment about Deutsche Coin. Um, I think he called it the entry drug to crack or cocaine. And uh, which kind of, I know where he was going with that and, and it kind of makes sense. It's, it's a good uh, learning of being able to get into uh, DeFi and crypto. It's, it's very cost effective, it's cheap and it's fun. Um, so I'm coming around a little bit on Deutsche Coin, but not much. Um, industries uh, that we've seen uh, dive in uh, to, to blockchain um, have, 
have been the following, and I'll just g use a couple um, examples that we've actually worked with. Um, the, the first one is kind of in the travel and mobility, and what we've seen there is um, uh, some really interesting things of uh, travel insurance. Uh, so again, because you can lock in and, and trigger things, uh, we had a, a company that basically did flight insurance. Um, so you would pay 12 or $13 to fly from you know, Jacksonville to New York, and then you would have travel insurance that you would populate. And then they built an oracle to actually look at uh, flight delay and flight cancellations. And if it was canceled, you'd automatically get your, your refund. Um, if the flight actually made it on time or, or made it, then obviously they would, they would take the money. Um, that was a really interesting uh, use case and it, and it works really well. They s started to expand to, uh, to other things, but again, you know, the amount of um, people that they've cut out, the amount of phone calls that they've cut out by automating that, and then again, having that transparency, um, in, our, in, in my opinion, has been huge. Um, Healthcare has dove, dove in headfirst in, in a lot of things, especially when it comes to personal data. Um, so with the blockchain, um, an end user basically controls who has the ability to um, access their tokens or their information. Um, so it's not, uh, there's some people that can probably figure out who owns what, um, but it's not, um, it's not publicly displayed unless you give someone permission to actually do it. Um, government, we've seen uh, a combination of different people and, and different governments um, uh, dive into this. Uh, one of the, the really cool things that we've done, again, is we, we worked with FedEx um, and we built out a proof of concept for customs, um, which was uh, very eye-opening. The ability to um, get a package through customs, regardless if it's the United States or the Caribbean, or overseas, um, not a lot of people ship the paperwork or things of the information that's needed to go through customs. They basically, everybody just ships. And if your package gets pulled by customs, then you have to figure out what to do, get all the packages together, give it to somebody, and then they present it to the government, the customs, to release that package. Um, if it's a solid good, then you know you might have a little bit of a delay, but if it's like produce, salmon, things like that, it could sit on the dock or sit somewhere for weeks or days and it could spoil and you could basically lose that product. Um, so again, because you can kind of grant people information through the blockchain, um, we have the ability to give customs um, certain keys to unlock uh, by a QR code or a, a NFC ticket or, or tag or whatever to, to pull that paperwork instantaneously as they pull that package and then put it right back into uh, the shipping uh, production. Uh, we've seen retail uh, dive into blockchain um, when it comes to warranties. So it's a very similar use case to insurance. Uh, so when you purchase a product, you basically fill out this information and then it basically tags that warranty to you or that product. So next time if the product fails or whatever, they have already have a serial number on our goods. Uh, they can look that up through the blockchain, see when you purchased it, if the warranty is actually still uh, enabled, and then trigger it instantaneously for you know, a new part or uh, however they're actually going to warranty it. Um, uh, the largest proof of concept that we've seen happen very quickly was actually with Walmart. Um, so if you walk into Walmart grocery, anything green in the store is on the blockchain. So you cannot work with Walmart as a giving them lettuce or produce or anything if it's not on their blockchain. Um, and the reason that they do that is because if they have a, an E. coli or salmonella or something that basically happens to certain um, produce, they want to be able to look up where it came from what region it came from almost instantaneously, and then also be able to prove that to the government of which stores are actually in compliance. So before, when we had that scare of um, the green stuff that they put in O'Charlie's soup, what was it? Ro uh, something like that, yeah. Uh, yeah, they basically pulled it all off the shelves, right? Because they couldn't, they weren't for sure 
knew where it was actually coming from. They just knew that they, when they tested a certain part of this, that there was E. coli. So that basically was a caster. It was just a horrible way of, of doing things. So what Walmart was able to do is say, hey, look, we're pulling it off the shelves of these stores because we feel like that's in that close region of where you did your testing. But all these other stores were leaving it on the shelf because we can prove that it's, it's not from that region and that it's clean. Yeah, and again, it basically, most of those use cases, again, come with a tamper-proof historical data uh, is, is the most that we've actually seen the reason to use blockchain. Um, and so for, for all those examples, we'll go back to the Walmart one, um, could, you, could they do that with a database? A absolutely, right? But who actually controls the database, right? And does the government actually trust Walmart uh, to a way that the data that's coming directly from them is trustworthy uh, compared to where with the blockchain, the government can basically, or whoever's you know, uh, wanting that, that trust information uh, can basically look at it themselves, right? They can see when the truck left uh, Bob's farm, it got scanned, um, you know, the, the bags that basically hold uh, the lettuce have this giant barcode on it and as it leaves, it gets scanned and written into the blockchain. And so there's no, database administrator from Walmart that can go in there and manipulate that data saying, oh, this, these, trucks are, these trucks are good. It's, it's tamper-proof historical data. So how do we get started? Oh, man, this is, um, I always recommend, in my opinion, of getting started and learning how to uh, jump into blockchain development is with uh, um, Crypto Zombies. It is super fun. It's a game, uh, it teaches you at the same time. Um, a lot of really neat projects have come out of it. Um, has anybody heard of Crypto Zombies? A show of hands, awesome. Uh, crypto Kitties, has anybody heard of Crypto Kitties? Crypto Kitties came out of uh, people learning from uh, Crypto Zombies. Um, there's also a lot of colleges that are they're publishing free um, how-tos. Uh, MIT has a great one, UPenn has a great one, and then, um, <coughs> There's also the, the paid, um, which I'll let you guys Google that. Um, what I like about um, a lot of these things is there's, there's mainnet and there's testnet. And testnet, um, you can do anything you want with fake tokens. It's not gonna cost you anything. Um, there's a faucet that basically gives you these free tokens. So there's, there's nothing that's actually gonna cost you. You don't have to go out and buy Bitcoin or Ethereum with your own money to learn how to do it. There is a testnet associated with it that gives you everything you need uh, to, to start learning. Yeah. So the other uh, thing about all of these networks is um, each one of these had a white paper, or usually has a white paper associated with it. Um, a lot of people uh, talk about it as kind of a manifesto or a, uh, a design, uh, initial design document. And um, people always ask, like, why should I go to Ethereum versus Algorand, uh, et cetera? And, and usually what I say is read the white paper. Uh, it could be extremely boring, uh, so just kind of skim it, but look how it's written. Um, see if it's in your kind of your style. Um, see if it maybe has an underlying um, charitable work associated with it. So maybe Stellar actually started moving money around for charities, et cetera. So each one of these have a, a really interesting white paper um, of why they actually came about um, uh, to do it. I wanted to basically put this, um, because I also get a lot of people to say, hey, I'm a, I'm a Ruby on Rails developer. How do I, what language should I actually jump in? So um, for, for here, uh, the, the most common um, blockchain developers that already know how to actually um, develop in blockchain are usually C, C++, and Java developers because uh, they can pick up um, Ethereum or Solidity, which is the language, um, EOS and Bitcoin almost instantaneously. Um, the second most popular is Python and Viper um, because again, you can talk directly to the networks. You already know the language. Um, with Golang or Rust, um, Solidity, Polkadot, and Hyperledger are already uh, in that language, so it'd be really easy for you to pick it up. 
Um, I have a little star there uh, next to Hyperledger because Hyperledger isn't considered a public um, blockchain, it's considered kind of a private blockchain, um, permission versus permissionless. So uh, Hyperledger is um, an IBM, is IBM? Yeah, and VMware has one as well, um, to where uh, you control everything and it's a, um, it's not a public, it's kind of, you can basically set up an internal um, a blockchain, a Hyperledger, um, and a, VMware has their own name for theirs, it's slipping my mind, but can, uh, can be considered uh, public. But a lot of Fortune companies uh, use Hyperledger uh, in their proof of concepts. Um, and then if you're JavaScript, TypeScript, or Node.js, um, there is um, a language out there called Lisk. Um, don't recommend it, but I mean, hey. And then there's two up and coming that I've never heard of, but I just wanted to throw them in there, um, which were Simplicity and Rolong. Yeah. Um, and if you're still on the fence of like, you know, what to learn, feel free to come talk. I can put you in touch with our developers because uh, all of our developers come from completely different background and range. Um, yeah. And they're the ones that actually kind of put this together for me, so. So um, DeFi, I'm going to kind of fly through because it's the one that gets me in the most trouble. Um, but let's, let's talk about what DeFi is. It, it's, uh, it used to be just a peer-to-peer -peer network when we first started, right? So uh, DeFi was the ability to basically uh, have a decentralized finance, uh, non-banking. Uh, basically, all of us could basically move money to each other without needing a, a third party or a centralized banking system. Um, but it's grown to be so much more now that we have the ability to actually do programming associated with these tokens. Um, so the, the stock exchange, um, someone has decentralized exchanges uh, to where you don't actually need a, uh, a broker or a third party to help you invest in certain exchanges. Um, the collateralization of assets has begun, um, which is if I have a bunch of Bitcoin and I don't want to um, exchange it for the US dollar because of the fees or I think next month it's actually going to go up. I can basically just say I'm going to use my Bitcoin as collateral and again you can program this and I want to borrow $100 and if I don't pay you back the $100 by X amount then you take $101 worth of my Bitcoin. So the, the DeFi is really off the charts when it comes to being able to, to do things on the blockchain. And full disclosure, I'm not a financial advisor and an attorney. And more importantly, I'm not your financial advisor and I'm not your attorney. Um, we love DeFi because of how we actually got into, into it. So my wife and I like to travel through the Caribbean at least once a year. And this particular year, 2012, 13, we went to Barbados. And um, we met these guys that essentially were doing something absolutely crazy. And um, they were creating the first uh, Bitcoin exchange for the Caribbean because the banking system there was basically a monopoly. So in order for anybody to move money from Barbados to Jamaica or any other island, it was a minimum of $29. Didn't matter if you were moving 10 bucks or more, $29 was the minimum that you could get away with. And they basically were upset about that because they had a lot of the islanders have families and fishermen and, and other um, people that jump on uh, the cruise boats to work that go from island to island, and to send them money, obviously that was just that was just too much. So uh, the the most cost effective way uh, for them to move money, and you're going to think I'm crazy, but I saw this with my own eyes. Uh, they brought me down to the dock and they introduced me to these fishermen that when they went from island to island, you could actually hand them an envelope of money and they would give it to your family at the other island for next to nothing compared to the, the money that you have to pay to use the rails. So, and that's basically what one of the inspiration was for them to build this is because I think a boat sank and lost a lot of the money that was supposed to be sent um, from island to island. So that was kind of their go-to. So that, that blew my mind of that particular use case. And so that's when our company actually started switching from regular 
fintech to, uh, to, to DeFi, to be able to see someone move that money for hay pennies from island to island and overcome that was, was very uh, amazing to us. Um, so again, we've already talked about um, programmable money. Um, let's talk a little bit about volatility, right? So a lot of people say, I'm never gonna get into Bitcoin because it, it just, it goes up, it goes down, and a horrible, uh, you know, uh, uh, DeFi strategy is buy high, sell low. Um, but there, there's other tokens in, in the DeFi that have been released, and they're, they're called stable coins. And what's neat about stable coins is um, the most popular one is called USDC and USDT uh, Tether. And um, uh, mostly the USDC is uh, known through Coinbase, is if you put a dollar into it, it holds that value. It doesn't go up and doesn't go down. It, it just, it's stable. So you always know you have that particular money in there. So now when you're building contracts and, and doing things, it, it gets a lot more fun because you know that if you put money into it, it's not, you don't have to worry about that volatility. And in the beginning of that, what we were really excited about, it was just, there was just that one marketplace, that one market side of just moving money very cleanly and not losing its value when it got to things. Because we knew what was gonna happen on the other side. So now if I have a bunch of money and I wanna put it into a stable coin, there's definitely someone out there that wants to do the other side of the market, which is lending and borrowing, right? So now I can, if I have some extra money, I can give it to, or I can stake it or put it up to where someone else can actually lend it out and give me a percentage um, based on their repayment. So we're now seeing the second half or the other side of this um, marketplace uh, on the DeFi of the lending and, um, and in the, in the, for deposits. Um, and we're also starting to see a lot of um, industries come in. So insurance that holds a lot of money is starting to make some uh, deposits in order to earn interest. Um, and then also we're seeing a lot of people again use that same concept of I'm going to allow people to borrow, I'm going to put my Bitcoin up as collateral because I want to get a, around taxation and be able to earn interest on it. <clears throat> um, the last point I have here is, is really interesting, is it, we're starting to see some interesting payroll uh, solutions come through DeFi. So uh, how many people here get paid every other week? How many people get paid monthly? How many people get paid daily? Do you know why that is? Usually your employer has to pay someone to be able to do all the taxations, write the checks, make the deposits, all that, and it, and it costs them a pretty penny in order to do that. So that's why they try to pay you on a less frequent, so they don't have to get through all those, those particular fees. What we found out with the blockchain and, and the DeFi side is it's hay pennies. So we can actually pay people anytime we want, and it was gonna cost a lot less than what employers are paying these, you know, third party companies to do your paycheck every two weeks, every month. So at the end of the day, um, you can be paid um, as long as you clock in, clock out, or however you actually um, prove that you, you've done, done your work, et cetera. Uh. So, um, so DAOs, um, DAOs, we'll talk about, a little bit about DAOs and also um, uh, NFTs, and those have been really fun for us in these last few years, um, just because we, we kind of see where they're going. Um, what is a DAO? So a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, a DAO, to, we are actually a DAO. Our company has transitioned into a DAO, uh, not by choice, but pretty much by force because of the way of our culture and way of our industry is actually going. Um, so I had um, three other partners when we started Web3 Devs. I've bought them out and they've all retired. Actually, one of them has started another startup, um, but they've, they've made a good chunk of money to where they don't have to work anymore. And the rest of the employees that have been there for quite a while are, are very similar to me is where I, I don't wanna retire. I just wanna, I'm having a lot of fun. So I just wanna, I just wanna keep going. 
And so we've structured um, the company into a DAO to where um, I don't have this, I don't have, um, I'm not like, you know, a dictator, um, but everybody has their word. Everybody has the ability to do things. And we started this with, with hackathons. And we're an 80-20 shop. So 80% of us, uh, our work is consulting for other people and 20% is what we want to do. And in that 20%, we basically put up for votes. Like, what do we want to do? And each person has the ability to put something up if they want to go to a hackathon or if they have a, like a little side um, project that they're doing and they want to steal um, or, you know, ask people to come in and, and do the front end for their app and things like that. We have a voting mechanism to actually do that. And uh, that's, that's really how the DAO uh, started coming um, internally. So now we, we use the DAO for everything. Um, so if you come to us with a project that you want us to do on the 80% side, um, we put it up for vote. So we only work on things that we actually are passionate or love or feel like um, uh, we just need the money. I don't know. Uh, so whatever their, whatever um, the motives is, we actually we put it up for we put it up for vote now. And I and I feel like that's going to be the future of it's going to trickle down. And I'll give you a couple examples of, of why we were forced um, to, to do this. Um, Aragon is uh, re was really early into the DAO space. So I would consider them kind of the, the SaaS solution for DAOs. So they, um, they give you basically um, all of the tools that you need to create the company, uh, create your token, create your governance token. They have the voting. Um, they have the rules associated with the voting. Um, so if you have, uh, let's just hypothetically say we have a million in um, governance tokens. And in order for you to vote, you have to have at least 20,000 in the tokens to vote. Um, they have the tools to write those rules to be able to do it. Um, they have the, the ability to do proxy. Um, so if I don't have 20,000, but I, I want to basically combine my tokens with Bob and have a vote, um, they have the ability to do that. And then they also have the ability for proxy. So if I trust Bob and his, but I don't have the time to vote or I don't ever want to vote, I can basically just give the proxy to, to Bob for him to be able to, uh, uh, to vote on my behalf. <clears throat> um, um, City Coins is a DAO, is creating a DAO, and it's been really a lot of fun watching them um, to do this. So, um, has anybody here heard of City Coins? How about Miami Coin? Has anybody heard of Miami Coin? No? Okay. Um, highly recommend uh, looking at Miami Coin. It's, it's come out of the City Coins. So, essentially, uh, a group of guys um, use a blockchain. It's kind of a side chain to Bitcoin uh, to where it's called stacks. And in order, and you get paid by stacking uh, your rewards in Bitcoin. And so what these guys did is they created city coins to where if you stack your Miami coin, I think there's a New York coin and there's about to be an Austin, Texas coin, 30% um, of the rewards goes directly to a city wallet. So um, for Miami, uh, they were able to, they were able to raise $18 million in the first six months um, in this wallet for, the, for them to actually be able to do whatever they want with the money to help the city. Um, they are on track to actually raise more money for the city than property taxes um, this year uh, using this particular technology. The problem that they were running into is um, can cities hold cryptocurrency on their books? So in Miami, the mayor there is, um, he's pretty awesome. He, he just doesn't give a shit. He just does what he wants. Um, he actually gets paid in crypto. Uh, I don't think he really cares whether or not they're supposed to be holding crypto. He just, he's gone forward, right? And so, um, but other cities are under compliance, under regulations. So they've, they've slowly been creating this DAO to where it's not only controlled by the city, it's actually controlled by the community as well. Um, so I believe Miami pulled out like $8 million recently to give to Section 8 and build uh, more affordable housing um, for, their, um, for their city. And when they did that, there was an uproar of why did you do this? Why couldn't we have done this? And now they're actually not spending the money. So now they've taken a step back of saying, okay, how much trouble are we actually going to get into? Which 
the city coin guys and girls basically said, okay, well, let's, let's make it to where the community actually has say of how we actually spend this money. And so now they're creating this DAO um, uh, structure uh, to be able to allow the community to vote, to proxy, uh, all these other things to be able to spend that money as they build more coins into more cities. Uh, LexDAO is uh, an interesting one. It's, it's full of attorneys. Um, so uh, basically they, they've created this membership um, DAO um, and it's kind of semi, uh, can be uh, anonymous uh, or um, 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 anonymous uh, to where you can bring projects to them um, regardless if it's in the crypto space or just in the general space and they will write white papers, they will do the due diligence on certain things, uh, they will give you opinion pieces of legislation, uh, et cetera. So there's some really, and you don't have to be an attorney uh, to be able to join uh, the membership and, and pitch, but um, you do have to own, own the coin in order to vote and uh, see certain uh, content uh, associated with it. Um, some people think that this is actually going to be uh, the new way that the bar associations um, will be done, which has been a really interesting thing to see um, how that how that will uh, associate. Um, I put Staker DAO up here just because that was one of the first DAOs um, to actually launch. And what they did is they allowed the, they raised a bunch of money uh, through an ICO. They had this large treasury, and uh, they created DeFi products. And so they created this DAO to allow the community. Um, to tell them what bridge or what DeFi tool they wanted built next. And so um, they, they launched that uh, well ahead of other people, so if, and, and they failed a lot too. So um, if you want to look at some, some great success and failure stories, uh, Staker DAO is a, a really good place to go. Uh, has anybody heard of Constitution DAO? One, yeah. So um, there was, a, I believe, a copy of the Constitution um, that was going up for auction or up for bid and a group of people got together and they wanted to buy it um, but they they wanted it to, to do it in a trusted way like I'm just not going to give two million dollars to Bob and be like hope he buys that you know so what they were able to do is again because of programmable uh, tokens everybody basically said okay we need to raise 13 million I don't want to have to set up a, a new LLC and this and that, so let's just do a DAO. Uh, everybody put money into it, and then they, they bid. Um, they ended up not winning the Constitution, uh, the copy of it, which was actually kind of interesting because then they had to return all of that money, right? So uh, because it was programmable, each person would have had a percentage or ownership value of that particular Constitution. Uh, but because it failed, they were able to trigger um, certain things for you to go back and actually retrieve your money back. And a lot of these people don't even know who the other people were, right? So they just basically put up their money, hope for the best, it didn't work out, they got their money back. So again, I, f I feel like that is a very powerful proof of concept of what's, what's to come um, in the future. The other th interesting things uh, that I feel are kind of going to come out of DAOs, and we're starting to see Wyoming, the state of Wyoming, actually be very DAO friendly. Um, so you can actually register an LLC, S Corp, other things that are associated with a DAO inside of Wyoming. Um, it has programmable compliance, right? So um, again, if you essentially want to have a voting mechanism for your board, for stock options, for anything, um, but you have to uh, you know, show the SEC or, or any government agency or, or maybe your board members, um, your rules and regulations have actually been accepted to that. Um, you can program it to do that, right? So during this board meeting, we had these votes, it got passed. If you wanna see the members that actually um, passed it, then it's all transparent, it's all, it's all right there. Um, They're, they're starting to get into um, court systems now, which is really interesting. It kind of blows my mind, so I'm not gonna go through much. I have a lot more reading uh, to do it, but if there's a um, grievance and or uh, arbitration that needs to be done, there are actually ways of programming that 
inside of a DAO, um, which again is, is uh, blowing my mind. Um, the other interesting thing, again, we saw that, that uh, constitution. Um, DAO of uh, now basically if someone wants to donate money or charity, uh, charitable items or, or anything associated with currency um, and you don't want to, you know, have that trust factor with just your church or, uh, you know, uh, someone else, now you have the ability to, to give that money to a DAO or an organization and then go back and actually look at how your money is being spent or how your charitable, make sure that your charity was charitable donation was spent in, in the correct way. So um, this is not gonna be very popular, but this, this, this part that was uh, forced on us, right? So we tried recruiting more developers uh, in, our, in our company. We've actually stopped uh, because it's, it's impossible. Uh, so the last two uh, interviews we had with uh, blockchain developers, they wanted uh, $300,000 a year and one to 2% of every token um, that they helped launch. And I did the same thing, I laughed. I'm like, you're freaking crazy until the second interview that I did that week was about the same. And these were basically the offers that these blockchain developers were getting. So it's, it's basically changed the way um, hiring is done. And, and it's because in, on the last slide, I'll show you basically how, to, how developers are getting paid in our, our, in our ecosystem. It's, it's because of that. It's, you can basically go to a DAO, um, you can go to a bounty, you can go to a grant, and you can make anywhere between uh, twenty dollars to $80,000 a month as a blockchain developer as long as you deliver in your milestones, right? So that's enough money not to have to work for the man anymore, right? So you can basically pay for your own health insurance. Um, you can figure out how to do your taxes uh, for that amount. Um, so it's completely changed our culture to where we actually, again, had to become a DAO, and then we had to do profit sharing inside of our, our, our company uh, in order to, one, keep the really good developers that we have now, and then also be able to attract uh, new talent. Um, so now our, our, our pitch isn't, we're gonna give you a salary, um, we're gonna allow you to work on whatever that you love, and then we're also going to allow you to see how much you're going to get paid on a per project basis. Um, the way that we do that is we, we divide it amongst um, uh, design, uh, whatever employees are associated with that project, and then we have a percentage that goes back to the company uh, to pay for like you know insurance and, and, and things like that. And it's completely transparent. All the employees actually see it. And that's, that's basically the only way we've been able to keep our ta top talent um, at our company. And I foresee that trickling down into other industries. Um, I, I foresee that being the future of how uh, hiring and recruiting is done uh, in, in the IT world um, is, is basically through a DAO. All right, NFTs. Um, we were really excited about where NFTs are going. Um, and I know everybody uh, might think an NFT is just a complete scam, which in the beginning, yeah, so did I. Um, but it, I think it's gonna be a game changer for the future of uh, digital and physical assets uh, uh, as within the next th three years. I wanted to avoid talking about wallets, but in order to talk about NFTs, we do have to talk about uh, wallets, right? So uh, a wallet essentially is a secure way of holding tokens, right? So when you have a, a Ethereum or, or any of those tokens, then um, you have a wallet to actually store it in. So there's just a quick list of all the wallets that are out there. There are tons of wallets, because when you learn how to um, develop in any language, the first thing that everybody creates is a wallet. Uh, so that's why we have so many really crappy wallets out there. Um, anybody here heard of MetaMask? Very popular. Um, the ones with the uh, asterisks next to it um, are cold wallets. So um, they're hardware. Uh, so uh, MetaMask, um, all these other ones are usually browser extensions or desktop or mobile um, to where I can basically have quick access um, to um, uh, to my tokens. 
um, ledger, treasure, or hardware to where I actually have to plug something in to do a two-factor or do something in order to release it. Um, so that's kind of the difference between the cold and hot wallets. And then um, NFTs essentially are also tokens. Um, so um, you, you need somewhere to basically uh, hold them. Not your keys, not your assets. It used to be not your keys, not your Bitcoin. Well, we've, we've changed it. So uh, for me, there's, there's no debate. Um, the, the reason a lot of these uh, wallet companies like Coinbase, they hold your keys for you is to make the experience, uh, make the recovery experience, make the, if you lost your uh, phone experience, um, much easier, right? So there's that kind of that security scale in the IT world. The, the more security you have, the less usability there is. The less security you have, the more usability you have. So it's the same in, in the wallet industry. So um, in Coinbase, if they hold, if anybody holds your keys and doesn't allow you to be the only one to know your keys, then they can take your tokens. There's no debate about that, right? So Coinbase says, yeah, we, we, we would never do that or we can't do that. They, they can. Right? Someone could basically go into Coinbase and take all your tokens and run away. Um, if you're the only one that has your keys to basically encrypt or decrypt and approve your wallet, you're the only one that has the ability to, to move those tokens around. All right, so what is an NFT? So the reason I stressed um, a Bitcoin is a Bitcoin, a dollar is a dollar is because that token is not unique, right? So the, the Bitcoin that I have is not unique from the Bitcoin that Bob has. It's, it's, it's kind of the same, it might have a different serial number, but the value of what it is, there's no uniqueness there. NFTs actually are unique. So they, they are tokens, but they have the ability to be uh, unique. And the first use case was basically those crazy JPEGs, right? So this JPEG is attached to this particular token. If I own this token, I own this JPEG which was stupid in the beginning. Nobody understood it. They're just like, why can't we just right click this and do a save as, and now I own the picture, right? But the, what's exciting for us is just that, that um, authority of having that token um, tamper-proof associated with that uh, for copyrights and, and future things that we're, we're about to talk about. What we're seeing um, NFTs uh, be able to do um, lately is uh, land titles and deeds associated with NFTs. So how, when you pay off your uh, land or your, or your mortgage or whatever, you can actually hold the title or things that are associated with your assets in your wallet. Like there's no third party that you have to go to. You don't have to go down to the title loan, uh, not, that was a bad example, the bank or anybody to actually um, prove or, or get your title, et cetera. Um, tickets at events. Uh, are being used as NFTs. And I just realized the time, so I'm gonna speed up here. Uh, imagine if you came here, your ticket was an NFT, you checked in, and that NFT actually gave you something. Like you got the, uh, a special message or something embedded um, from the keynote speaker. Or you got uh, an autograph signature um, from Garth Brooks when you went to the ticket uh, for, with his concert and things like that. So we're seeing the programmable NFTs be able to do unique things uh, associated with it. Um, obviously there's rare art, uh, music rights, and now we're starting to see DeFi come in and be able to collateralize your NFTs. So if I have that uh, ape that I don't want to actually give to someone to get money back, I can collateralize that uh, to be able to, to get money out. Um, same with the land title. So imagine not having to go to a bank, imagine I can prove that my house is worth a million bucks and I need a, a sub loan to do solar on my, on my roof. And I could come to you guys and say, I need to borrow uh, $50,000. I'll give you $55,000 back at the end of this project. Any of us can actually do it. We don't have to go to that bank anymore. That to me is really exciting of, of where um, this, these technologies are actually going. All right, so I'm gonna fly through this. Um, Lazy.com is a uh, Mark Cuban project uh, that helps you display all of your NFTs. There's a link for mine if you wanna see it. Floaties are interesting. Uh, it's an NFT project that ages over time. 
So if you think about that, there's many use cases there. I actually have the full copyrights of the image for my floaty. Um, so I've actually used it in a movie. I created a, a Jeopardy game with other floaties um, and, and produced it. Uh, Puzzle Punks is um, a NFT that actually expands to other NFTs. And in, in this use case, they um, uh, put a nose, a beard, ears, and they broke it into to where you can make your own uh, a cyberpunk. And so that was really exciting to us because if you think about a, a builder that buys a plot of 100 acres that then wants to put um, 10 houses on it and wants to eventually break that out into uh, land titles, that technology is, is now existing. So these are the things that um, are essentially coming out of these proof of concepts that everybody thinks is, is stupid. The Lex Dow again, is a membership. It's kind of like the... Uh, um, the apes um, to where if you don't have this particular um, token, you're not allowed to see this content. You're not allowed to do certain things, so it's an authentication. Um, Golden Ticket is um, a group of people that have put original uh, content for movies, kind of like Netflix in place, and if you don't have a Golden Ticket, you're not allowed to get in. And then Sharky Sharks is an NFT uh, technology that when you burn it, which means destroy it, you actually get something else. Um, which the underlying technology of that is something that uh, we're really interesting in, in watching as well. Oh, okay. So, all right. So, Gitcoin grants and dev posts. So, when I talked about the, uh, the white papers, um, every one of those networks usually has a grant program uh, to where you can go in, submit anything up to $5,000 to learn what they're doing. And the reason that they're doing this is because they want to pull people away from other networks. They're all fighting for the best developers. So the way to do that is to use your treasury and use money to attract developers. So their grants and their bounties are extremely high right now. Uh, so Algorand, Solana want to pull away from Ethereum. So if you go to those websites and look at all the grants that you can propose, um, they'll usually get approved very quickly. Uh, Gitcoin is a open source project to where any companies or any DAOs or any associates can put a project up there with a budget and you can start uh, bidding on it. And then uh, there are a ton of hackathons out there and the prizes for crypto hackathons are unreal. Um, I think uh, the one that, that we saw in um, Miami this year, uh, two guys are going to space. Like they're, they're putting them up in that what you call thing that goes up into space, the space hotel or whatever. Um, that's how crazy some of these uh, prizes are going for uh, in, our, in our particular industry. Thank you and uh, appreciate it.